a ring of fire eclipse sweeps across the Americas. Two weeks later, we witness a partial lunar eclipse. The skies are alight with the Orionid and Taurid meteors. Venus reaches greatest western elongation. And my 2024 night sky calendar is now finally available for pre-orders by following the link in the video description down below. Welcome back to another episode of What's in the Night Sky for October 2023 and we have a jam-packed month coming up so let's just dive into the most exciting event of the month, perhaps the most exciting event of the year. On October the 14th there's a ring of fire eclipse or to call it by its proper name an annular solar eclipse. Now eclipses happen when the moon blocks the sun from view and the reason we don't have an eclipse every new moon is because the orbit of the moon around Earth is tilted by about 5 degrees against the orbit of Earth around the Sun, so most of the time the new moon just passes underneath or above the Sun in the sky. However, a few times a year their paths align and the moon blocks the Sun from view, and this can happen in a few different ways. So there's a total solar eclipse where the moon covers the Sun entirely from view, there's a partial solar eclipse where the moon blocks part of the sun. And then there's an annular solar eclipse where the center of the moon passes by the center of the sun, but the moon is not big enough to cover the sun entirely, and there's a ring of sun still visible around the moon, hence the moniker Ring of Fire. Now eclipses can only be seen from very specific parts of Earth, so let's take a look at the eclipse map. In order to see the Ring of Fire, you have to be on the red line, which is known as the Path of Annularity. It crosses the USA from Oregon to Texas, it then passes over Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, parts of Belize, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Panama, Colombia, and then right across northern Brazil. If you're in the orange or yellow bands, you'll still be able to see a partial eclipse, so the moon center won't pass through the sun center, and you will see a crescent of fire instead of a ring. The time of max eclipse and the position of the sun in the sky when annularity occurs will vary depending on where you are. So for those in the US, the event will occur shortly after sunrise when the sun is fairly low in the sky in the east. As it crosses South America, the event will occur closer to noon when the sun will be higher in the sky. And as it crosses Brazil, it will be closer to sunset when the sun has dropped a bit lower to the western horizon. As usual, I'll put a link in the video description down below so you can find specific information for your exact location. And one final note, for the love of God, please do not look at the sun at any time during this eclipse without wearing protection over your eyes. And if you're shooting the eclipse, make sure you have a solar filter on the front of your lens to protect your lens and your camera from damage. Now, solar eclipses never come alone. They always happen either two weeks before or two weeks after a lunar eclipse. And in this case, it's two weeks before because on the 28th, there is a partial lunar eclipse. Like solar eclipses, there are different types of lunar eclipses. And to understand the different types, you first have to know that the shadow from Earth cast by the sun is split into two cone-shaped projections that kind of blow out into space. There is the darker inner umbra shadow and then the outer penumbra half shadow. If the moon passes completely through the umbra shadow, we have a total lunar eclipse where the moon turns blood red. If the moon only passes through the penumbral shadow, we have a penumbral lunar eclipse where there is a faint gradient across the moon. If part of the moon passes into the umbra shadow, we have a partial lunar eclipse, which is the case on the 28th. So there will be a faint gradient across the moon as well as a little bit of a shadow visible on the limb of the moon. The magnitude of the eclipse is only 0.12, so only a very small amount of the moon will dip into the umbral shadow and have a quite a visible shadow on the moon. So I will warn you, it's not the most exciting of events, especially after a ring of fire eclipse, but the mainstream media are probably going to blow it way out of proportion. They'll probably use images of a total lunar eclipse, create all this crazy hype, and it just leads to disappointment, which is bad for astronomy in the long run because people don't like being duped, and then it's more difficult to encourage them to get out and enjoy the night sky. So... Keep your expectations low. There will be a faint gradient across the moon and a little bit of a visible shadow on the limb of the moon. But the event is a subtle one. 
Now, unlike solar eclipses, lunar eclipses are visible from a much larger area of Earth. So let's take a look at the eclipse map. So anyone within the large middle colored chunk will be able to see the partial eclipse and those in the thinner colored bands either side will be able to see a penumbral eclipse only. Again, I'll put links in the video description down below so you can find more specific information for your exact location. Now let's take a look at the Milky Way this month. So starting in the Northern Hemisphere, the core is all but gone now. As darkness falls, it's hiding behind the Southwestern horizon, but the Great Rift, a dark dust lane which blocks the Milky Way behind it from view, is left standing vertically against the horizon and that pushes into the west, setting itself around midnight. After that, the bright fuzzy Cygnus region of the Milky Way sinks down to the northwestern horizon. Facing east and after midnight, the region of the Milky Way that passes through the winter circle asterism of stars rises into the sky along with some familiar faces like Taurus, Orion and Gemini, with the full asterism being above the horizon by about 1.30am local time. In the southern hemisphere, you can still get a glimpse of the Milky Way core as darkness falls before it sinks to the western horizon, where the Milky Way band is practically parallel with the surrounding horizon. So then we have to turn and face east to see the Milky Way band rise again, along with the same familiar faces of Gemini, Orion and Taurus. And this presents an opportunity for a Milky Way arch panorama. It's also worth noting that facing south, the Large Magellanic Cloud starts the night low in the sky if you want to capture it with a standard focal length and include some sort of foreground interest. But if you use a wider lens, you can capture it along with Sirius and Canopus, the two brightest stars in the night sky. Now, talking of bright objects in the night sky, not only are we in the period that sees the most sporadic meteors, in other words, meteors that are not associated with annual meteor showers, there are a few annual meteor showers that you need to be aware of. So starting with the Orionid meteor shower, which is active for the entirety of the month and even into November as well, but the peak is expected to happen on the morning of the 22nd. The radiant point is within the constellation Orion, but remember you don't have to look in the direction of the radiant point. As long as the radiant point's in the sky, meteors will fall all over the sky. It's just that if you trace a line backwards from the path that they trailed in the sky, all of the meteors point back towards a point in the constellation Orion, which is what gives the meteor shower its name. But one thing to note is that the higher the radiant point is in the sky, the more likely you are to see meteors. And the constellation Orion rises in the east in the late evening and climbs higher and higher into the sky as we approach the pre-dawn hours. And this is great news when you check out the moon phase around the peak, because on the 22nd, there's a first quarter moon, which means the moon will set around midnight, leaving the pre-dawn hours nice and dark and perfect for viewing meteors. But of course, it's not just the moonlight. Make sure you head to a rural location with not so much light pollution. That way you'll be able to see more meteors. And around the time of the peak, the meteor shower will max out at around 10 to 20 meteors per hour. Now, Orionids tend to be very fast and they streak across the sky in the blink of an eye, but they do often leave persistent trains of color in the sky, which you'll also pick up in your photographs as well. And even though the peak is predicted to be on the morning of October the 22nd, it's definitely worth getting out on the morning of the 21st and the morning of the 23rd as well. These predictions are not always accurate, and they'll also vary depending on where you are on planet Earth as well. So just try all of the mornings around the 22nd. Now, adding fuel to the meteor shower fire are the torrid meteor showers. And I use the plural because there are two somewhat separate meteor showers, the northern torrids and the southern torrids. And this has nothing to do with northern hemisphere or southern hemisphere. Just like the Orionids, these are meteor showers that you can see from both the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. It's just that the radiant point of both of the meteor showers is within the constellation Taurus, hence the name the Taurids. 
And there's one of them has a radian point which is slightly more northerly in equatorial coordinates. So that's the radian point of the northern torrid meteor shower and vice versa. It's believed that it used to be a single meteor shower, but the gravity of Jupiter split the stream of meteorites into two separate streams. So there's now two radian points. Now the torrid meteor showers are a little bit different to other meteor showers in that they don't really have a sharp peak of activity. There are some estimates for the peak, and I think the Southern Tories is around November the 6th, and the Northern Tories is around November the 13th, although this is constantly debated, but they both tend to just rumble on for a long period of time, producing about five meteors per hour each. And so you get 10 meteors per hour when they both overlap. And so particularly towards the latter half of October and the start of November is when you'll see the most torrid meteors. But they'll just be kind of sporadic every night. There's no real strong peak. And the other good thing about the torrids is that even though they don't produce many meteors per hour, they do produce a high rate of fireballs. And these are slow-moving bright meteors that are brighter than Venus in the night sky and they often have this really strong green color to them so keep your eye out for torrid fireballs especially at the end of this month and well if you're heading off for the Orionids you could see hopefully a lot of meteors and the northern skies are green again or in some cases red now last month I mentioned that the northern hemisphere was finally dark enough to enjoy the northern lights again and to keep an eye out because around the equinoxes there tends to be an amazing display of aurora and last month we did see an absolutely incredible display that was seen as far south as Switzerland. Now there's no scientific consensus around the equinox aurora but we definitely saw an amazing display last month and as we're now in solar maximum we can only expect to have more displays like this but what an incredible start to the season in the northern hemisphere finally let's take a look at the moon and planets this month so full moon occurs at the end of the month again on october the 28th this month it's the hunter's moon as it's the time of year when game are fattening up for the winter and provisions are needed for the long cold months ahead. As for the planets, Saturn can be found retrograding in Aquarius. It starts the night high in the southeast and spends the night arching across the south in the northern hemisphere. But for those in the southern hemisphere, it arches high overhead and more in the north. Jupiter can be found retrograding in Aries, shining at a bright minus 2.9 this month. It rises in the east shortly after darkness falls and arches across the southern skies for those in the northern hemisphere. But for those in the southern hemisphere, it heads straight up overhead and arches across the northern skies. Venus can be found rising in the east in the pre-dawn hours, losing some brightness this month, dropping from minus 4.7 to minus 4.4. And it reaches greatest western elongation on the morning of October the 23rd, when it will be 46 degrees away from the sun in the sky. It's also joined by a thin crescent moon on the 10th, and the 11th and that's all i've got for you this month guys let me know what you're most looking forward to this month in the comments down below and now on to the hashtag wittens for those of you that are new here every month i set a target subject or theme for people to photograph that month for a chance to win a prize third place wins a copy of my astral workflow lightroom presets second place wins a constellation hoodie and first place wins a copy of my book photographing the night sky if you're uploading to Twitter, use the hashtag Wittens. If you're uploading to Instagram, tag at Wittens underscore Alan Wallace in your images with a physical tag. A mention in the description or the comments is not enough. Last month, I was looking for images of the Aurora, Comet Nishimura, or the Zodiacal Light, and I ended up picking one of each. So in third place was JL Chacon 73 with this beautiful image of the Zodiacal Light stretching high into the sky above the Peruvian mountains. Also got Venus shining incredibly bright there as well. In second place was Tanya with this image of the Northern Lights from Llandudno in Wales, my home country. So this image got me feeling a bit nostalgic as it's been a long time since I went aurora hunting 
in Wales. And in first place was Astro Jairus with this beautiful image of Comet Nishimura above Oriolo de Fici in northern Italy. It's really nicely composed and I loved the nice natural editing and it's just an overall lovely image. This month I'll be looking for images from either the solar or lunar eclipse or any image that includes a meteor. Thanks for making it this far into the video. Hit subscribe if you haven't already. If you haven't seen my latest video about budget setups for Milky Way photography, be sure to check that out. And as always, if you're going out to enjoy the night sky anytime soon, I wish you good luck in clear skies. Thank <laughs> you.